in the post-op setting or in some patients in the medical ICU. If you're looking at patients with congenital heart disease, the RV is a big piece of what is going on with these cases, be it its size as well as its function and how it changes after uh, the operations that they go through. Certainly has been its RV size and function have been looked at and noted to be important predictors of outcome in different settings, including myocardial infarction, heart failure reduced EF, heart failure preserved EF, valvular heart disease, mitral tricuspid, aortic, uh, pulmonic, as well as in different cardiomyopathic disorders. We will not cover the specific diseases, but we will talk about uh, <clears throat> the RV function per se and its size. So what are the views that we utilize to assess RV function? The challenge for the right ventricle, unlike the left ventricle, is it has different pieces, if you would, or different segments. And these segments, to see them and to put good a global perspective of what the RV is doing, you need multiple views. Uh, that adds challenges in that we may see the same segment in different views. We do not have perfect landmarks that can tell us if the cut that we did is the right cut that gets you in the proper plane or it's an oblique cut and this can lead if there are off-axis views with oblique cuts to under or overestimation of the RV. So at the end, when we look at the RV, whoever is doing that needs to put everything together as opposed to pulling a view and saying, this is why I decided to call it this way. So the first one is the parasternal long axis view that gets you the anterior wall of the right ventricle. I will use my mouse. Um, and we can do a measurement here for the right ventricular, part of the right ventricular outflow tract. This part has much less muscle than the RV that you see in the four chamber view. Uh, and the dimension that we measured would be measured from the anterior wall here to the junction between the interventricular septum and the anterior aortic root. The upper limits of normal here uh, is about 30 millimeters. Some disease states, for example, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy can be associated with abnormalities in that region of the right ventricle. And so skipping over this and not paying attention to it can be problematic. Um, the view can be variable depending on where we put the transducer and also depending on the angulation of that transducer. Sometimes because of the narrow intercostal spaces, it becomes difficult to get that nice alignment that you see. And we end up with a view where the apex of the ventricle is almost brought in or where you see pep muscles. If you do that, there, this is not the proper plane. And not only it would affect the RV assessment, but also your measurements for the left ventricle. Another parasternal long axis view that we look at is a view that gets us the RV outflow tract, the pulmonic valve as you see, and then the part of the pulmonary artery above the pulmonic valve. You can measure the annulus diameter, you can measure part of the RV outflow tract, you can put color and you can see what is happening. For example, patients with infundibular stenosis, this would be a very helpful view if you want to quantify flow through the RV outflow tract. That's again a view that can be of value. Uh, another view still, we are parasternal long axis views, is the RV inflow view. And that view gets you the anterior wall of the right ventricle, the inferior or the diaphragmatic wall of the right ventricle. That's the wall that sits on the diaphragm. You can see both pep muscles um, and you can see the caudal apparatus and you can see the tricuspid leaflets, the anterior and posterior leaflets. You can put color and if there is tricuspid regurgitation, you can look for it and interrogate it. Sometimes you can also see the coronary, the inferior vena cava flow and sometimes the coronary sinus. If you see the eustachian valve, this would be the view to look for it. Then we go to the series of parasternal short axis views. And so we are still in the parasternal position and the first cut is at the level of the base of the RV. 
And as you see, both atria are seen here. You can see the interatrial septum. You will see part of the RV outflow tract. This is considered the proximal area or region of the RV outflow tract. The distal region is noted here. Uh, you can look at the interatrial septum in this view. You can interrogate it with color. So if there is interatrial shunt, you can pick it up. You can also look at the flow across the tricuspid valve with pulse wave and with continuous wave Doppler and certainly get the tricuspid regurg. So, so far, whoever is following with me, there are two positions that we can get and we should get the tricuspid regurg jet from the parasternal long axis RV in flow view and the parasternal short axis at the base of the RV. Of course, if you see the RV outflow tract, you can also align with the flow in the RV outflow tract. Where we measure the RV outflow tract proximal region in the uh, parasternal short axis view is here from that anterior aortic uh, wall or root to the uh, center or to the corresponding point on the anterior wall of the right ventricle. The upper limits of normal here is 35 millimeters. For the distal RBOT, the upper limits of normal is 27 millimeters. That these values were taken from normal individuals, but the studies that reported on these values did not report the size um, and it was not possible to do individual level data so you can do a meta-analysis and look by gender or by sex that wasn't done and that poses a challenge in general for relying on linear dimensions because of their uh, when the upper limits were reported and recommended in the guidelines they did not take into account the size of the individual Another parasternal short axis view can be very useful and is needed if you're looking at patients with congenital heart disease. It will get you not only the RV outflow tract, the valve, the part above the valve and the pulmonary artery, but also the bifurcation. As you can see, this would be a wonderful view to look for um, RVOT pathology, to sample flow through the RV outflow tract and quantify it. Uh, look at pulmonary valve disease, if there is a PDA, may also be seen in that position. Its flow would be captured in that position, if you would. Uh, moving th still at the level of the parasternal short axis view, so the basal level was at that base of the RV. If we go a little bit lower, cut of the ventricle, so now we are moving from the base to the apex, the first level that meets us is at the level of the mitral valve. And here you will catch the anterior, the lateral, and the inferior walls of the right ventricle. Frequently, we do not see the wall that crisp so that we can measure its thickness. And it is not recommended that you measure RV thickness in that view. It may give you an idea about the size, but again, it's just an idea. It is not where we rely or what we rely on finally in saying this RV is enlarged or not, and then how much enlargement. Function may be assessed as you look at that crescent and you see how much it changes from end diastole to end systole. But remember, this is just one level of the RV, one region of the RV, and by itself would not necessarily give you the global picture. Uh, of course, there is another cut, which is the level of the pap muscles. I will skip that one. It would still be showing the anterior, lateral, and inferior regions of the RV, but at a level more epical to the basal cut. Now we go to the epical views. And so the transducer here is in an epical position, and many of you are familiar with the epical four-chamber view. That view will show you the lateral wall of the RV, you will see the base, the med, and you will see the apex. And in that view, it is possible to do some measurements at the base and the med, as well as the LV long axis, RV long axis. You will see the tricuspid valve. You can interrogate the tricuspid inflow with a pulse wave Doppler sample volume at the annulus and the tips for RV diastolic function. You will also uh, look for the tricuspid regurg and align with the regurg. You will see the interatrial septum to some extent, but uh, we have other positions that will give us a closer look for the interatrial septum.
the view that is most useful and is part of the routine protocol for transthoracic imaging is the RV focused view. And the goal of getting to that, the reason we want to get to that position is this is the position that will open up the RV and will show us the base of the right ventricle. To get to that position, the transducer may need to be in a medial or lateral uh, location. It, you would aim to get a scanning sector where the LV apex is at the center of that scanning sector. Why do I care for these sort of uh, mark, guide marks? To avoid under or overestimation. If it rotates too much, too obliquely, either forward or backward from the proper plane, you will end up with a smaller or a larger RV basal dimension. The basal dimension is taken just below the tricuspid annulus and the upper limits of normal in the 2015 guidelines is 4.1 centimeters. The mid level of the RV is measured midway between the tricuspid annulus and the apex and its upper limits is about 35 millimeters you can say at the level of the pep muscles, sometimes we do not see them clearly. So it would be hard to go by the pep muscle as the mark to where to go. The maximum lung axis of the right ventricle is 83 millimeters. Many times this is foreshortened and we end up with a smaller RV lung axis. Because of that, the distal segments of the RV may not be well visualized and one has to be careful because some pathology, for example, patients with a left anterior descending coronary artery, a large vessel may end up supplying the RV apex and there may be RV dysfunction that for the apical segment that doesn't get recognized. Uh, and of course, we look at the tricuspid inflow and the tricuspid regurge. Another position is a modified four chamber view. This is a nice view we, you get by sliding lower on the chest wall aimed at opening up that lateral wall of the RV. So you will have a better appreciation of thickening that is happening or not happening in that lateral wall. You can also see the right atrium, the tricuspid valve. Look for tricuspid regurge, look for interatrial shunt. When you do a bubble study, this is a very nice position because it will show you the bubbles as they come in and whether there is any cross. While useful to have a feel for the RV contraction, it is not recommended that you use it for measurements. So we do not rely on this to do assessment of RA size or RV dimensions. Two other views that are not that frequently utilized, but we'll mention them quickly, is the RV apical five chamber view. This is the only view that will get you the moderator bend. And it gets more of the anterior lateral, if you would, RV free wall. If you aim for the coronary sinus, the view that will get you more of the infrolateral or posterolateral RV free wall. Again, you can look for the tricuspid regurg in these regions and try in these views and try to align with it. So, so far we relied on two positions for the, of the transducer. One is at the level of the uh, parasternal location. The second one is the apical location. Sometimes you do not have windows. And here we go to the subcoastal views. These can be more challenging to obtain, but may make a huge difference in, re, in, re, in looking at the RV uh, as well as some of the flows even at the level of the valves as you will see. So the first one is a four chamber view that gets you the four chambers. You see the interatrial septum. You can interrogate flow by color Doppler and not only interrogate flow but get very good alignment. So if there is a, a flow between the two atria be it congenital or iatrogenic and you want to catch it that's the position you want to be in. You will as you can imagine from the epical views the ultrasound plane will be at right angles to the direction of the flow and you wouldn't be catching the actual velocities or the true representation of the peak velocities. This is the view that we rely on when we want to do our V wall thickness and we'll talk about that briefly. Um, 
So aside from getting the four chamber view from the subcoastal position, it is also possible to get the basal RV short axis view similar to the one you get from the parasternal position in the subcoastal position uh, with the transducer located in the subcoastal region. Here you can see the valves, the aortic, the tricuspid, the pulmonic, and you can get very good alignment with RVOT flow. So these are the views that we rely on, how we get them and the different transducer locations. Now let's talk some about the blood supply of the right ventricle and the possibility of looking at segmental dysfunction. Before going further, many times the first thing that comes to mind when you see segmental dysfunction is thinking of coronary artery disease, and that is the right path, but certainly other disorders can result in segmental dysfunction. For example, uh, patients with myocarditis, for example, patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and that's why you want to utilize all the views and look at the segments. So the main supply of the RV comes from the right coronary artery, specifically the acute marginal branch. That acute marginal branch supplies the anterior wall and it supplies the lateral wall. So we get to this from the long axis parasternal RV inflow view and this one from the apical four chamber view as well as the RV focused view. The other uh, source of blood supply to portions of the right ventricle is the conus branch. This is an early branch from the right coronary artery. Sometimes it can have a separate ostium. And this uh, supplies the RV outflow tract. Sometimes in patients with LAD occlusion, collaterals will come from that uh, small branch. How about the interventricular septum? Here we're talking about the if you would, not the anterior, but the posterior part. That gets its supply from the posterior descending artery. So inferior septum, base mid segments take their supply from that, but the distal septum gets its supply from the LAD, shown here in blue, as well as the moderator band. The moderator band gets its blood supply from the LAD. Uh, we mentioned the segmental dysfunction in the coronary supply as important. Another setting aside from CAD where that supply to the RV becomes important is in patients undergoing alcohol septal ablation. Sometimes the septal perforators end up supplying regions of the right ventricle and you need to see if there is a RV supply from these septal perforators before the artery is occluded by the injection of alcohol. Um, so now we are still talking RV morphology. Let's talk about RV wall thickness. Where do we see the RV wall thickness and where do we measure it? You can see the RV wall from all of the views we just talked about, but the trick is you want to see it uh, relying on the best resolution that will allow you to make the good measurements or the more accurate measurements. And here the axial resolution as opposed to the lateral resolution comes in mind from the subcoastal position. The example that you see here, which is taken from the guidelines of 2010 is a nice, easy example. The challenge comes in individuals who have a lot of trabeculations, pap muscles, etc. These have to be excluded. Sometimes the visceral pericardium and the fat that are present on the RV free wall also cause problems. You want to exclude them, otherwise you will obviously overestimate the wall thickness. There are multiple levels that you can measure it. The recommendation is to do it at the tip of the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. You want to zoom on it, you want to adjust your depth, you can use a mode as well, and you measure it at end diastole. The upper limits of normal is five. I'm emphasizing the side of hypertrophy, but RV thinning, wall thinning can also happen because of coronary disease or again in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. There are no specific values that say a thickness less than X is abnormally thin. Also be aware that harmonic imaging can result in somewhat thicker uh, free wall, so you want to use fundamental imaging 
when you go to uh, getting the RV wall thickness. So we talked about the dimensions already, the basal, the mid, and the long axis, and I told you the upper limits of normal. Um, so again, I'll say it one more time, 41, 35, 83, if you do RV size, and if you want to be sort of um, keep it in mind all the time, you have to look at these measurements, apply them, and remember them. Otherwise, it will be sort of, that's my impression, it looks big, not good enough. Uh, if you want to go by impressions, one quick approach is to compare the size of the RV to the LV, and the RV is, should be smaller in size than the LV, at most two-thirds of the size of the LV. So if my transducer location is in the right spot and I end up showing the RV the same size as the LV, then that's a substantial enlargement. And sometimes with further RV enlargement, the LV gets displaced and the actual apex point of maximum impulse that you palpate on the chest wall is made by the RV, not the LV. Uh, talking about indices of function now. So one of the indices of systolic function is shown here called the fractional area change. We trace the end diastolic area and the end systolic area. The change in area divided by the end diastolic area is the RV fractional area change. You do that in the epical four chamber view. The problem with relying on the RV fractional area change, it's just part of the RV, it's not the whole RV. And that's an edge for 3D and why we want to use 3D. We'll talk about 3D shortly. The way you start the tracing is just below the tricuspid annular plane and you want to hug the endocardium as far as you can see it and then you go all the way up along the septum to the medial side of that annulus. And these are nice examples of something that is normal, low normal and clearly abnormal. The lower limits of normal is 35%. There has been validation comparing the RV fractional area change against radionuclide and geography and against CMR, and significant correlations are reported, though as you can expect there will be uh, several discrepancies that you can see in some cases because again this is not a true global measurement of the RV as opposed to EF uh, by either of the other two modalities. Let's talk about other techniques that rely, do not rely on the 2D image, but rely on Doppler. Uh, the first one is DPDT. If you remember from the hemodynamics lecture, we introduced the idea of DPDT. Basically, you are looking at how fast the pressure rises in the ventricle. And say you have a high fidelity catheter that can do that, a ventricle where its pressure rises fast, then that's a better contracting ventricle. So we need the pressure surrogates. And so we go to the modified Bernoulli equation and we try to convert the velocities to pressures. Uh, and the guidelines speak of two points, one corresponding to a velocity of one meter per second and the other corresponding to two meters per second. So if you do the modified Bernoulli, the one is four millimeters mercury and the two is 16 millimeters mercury. The difference between them is 12. And so it, the only part that is left in the denominator to obtain is the time interval between these two points. And this is where uh, if you measure that in seconds, you will get the DPDT. The, upper, uh, the lower limits of normal on the right side is 400 millimeters mercury per second. Technical aspects you need to see uh, the jet as clearly as you see it here. Sometimes this is feasible, sometimes this is not. Then there are problems. The problems with the modified Bernoulli, it's an, as you remember, it's a modified equation. It does not include the inertial term. The assumption that we are making also here is that the rise in velocity or the rise in pressure is due to the change in RV systolic pressure without any change in the right atrium something that may or may not be valid, particularly in diseased hearts with dilated atria and increased RA stiffness. And so one 
way you can look at this is you look at the rate of rise. Are you looking at a steep rise or a slower rise? So more of a qualitative rather than me taking the time to do these measurements. This has been used mostly in the research setting and in previous studies, not currently. The other approach is myocardial performance index. And the idea behind the myocardial performance index is we want to figure how much time the ventricle spends in ejection as opposed to getting ready to contract or contracting with the valves closed and then relaxing with the valve closed. So the more the time a ventricle spends in ejection as opposed during isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation, the better that ventricle. The numerator for the myocardial performance index also referred to it as the T index after Dr. T who introduced that concept is the sum of isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation times and the denominator is the ejection time. Where do we get the ejection time? We get that from RVOT flow with the pulse wave Doppler at the level of the RV outflow track just below the pulmonic valve. Then how do we get to isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation? On the right side, you will end up needing to measure signals from different positions. And so you have to pay attention to the RR interval. As much as possible, they should be similar. So one way of getting the numerator of that expression is to measure the time interval between the end of atrial A velocity at the level of the tricuspid uh, valve to the beginning of the E velocity of the next cycle. If you ask yourself what does that time interval include, it includes the contraction time, the ejection time, and the relaxation time. So if you subtract from that time the ejection time, then you have the numerator. Another approach is to get the total duration of the tricuspid regurg, which corresponds to these three time intervals, and subtract from it the ejection time. The upper limits of normal is 0.43. The problems with the T index or with the global myocardial performance index is that in the numerator we have isovolumic contraction time and isovolumic relaxation time. Isovolumic contraction time can be prolonged with conduction disorders and isovolumic relaxation time can be short in the presence of a high right atrial pressure. So you can have a sick heart where the right atrial pressure goes up, RV function is bad but isovolumic relaxation time is short and therefore you do not see a ratio that is increased. To circumvent the problem of getting these measurements from different cycles, we, one can obtain the tissue Doppler of the lateral side of the tricuspid annulus here and you have the isovolumic contraction, the systolic ejection velocity, isovolumic relaxation, early and late diastolic velocity. And the, you say the duration of that systolic ejection corresponds to the ejection velocity. And then to get isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation, you get the time interval between the onset of that isovolumic contraction velocity and the end of the isovolumic relaxation velocity. And then subtract from that the ejection time. They are not the same, meaning if I do it by pulse wave Doppler is different than if I do it by tissue Doppler. The upper limits of normal are different. So for the pulse wave Doppler approach, it's 0.43. For the tissue Doppler, is 0.54. And again, the same concern applies. If a high right atrial pressure is present, that ratio may look in the normal range, even though RV performance or contraction is not normal. So again, these, uh, have faded to some extent in the day-to-day -day practice. Another tool that we rely on for RV function is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, TAPSI. And what it simply means is how much the annular plane moves during systole towards the apex. A normal ventricle, you will have a good degree of excursion. A diseased ventricle, you will have less degree of excursion that has been looked at in multiple uh, studies in different patient populations and is associated with outcome. The challenges uh, for relying on the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, in part, you need good alignment. Second, 
that excursion can be reduced after surgery. It's one part of the RV function. It's not the whole RV function, components of contraction, if you would. And so it could be reduced, but say RPEF is preserved. So you have to sort of look at it and then look at other things as well. Uh, instead of looking at the absolute displacement or distance, now we can look at the rate of displacement if we measure the velocity by uh, the spectral pulse Doppler or by color-coded. Color-coded, there was a time when there was a lot of interest in it. Nowadays, not much interest in that velocity. In general, color-coded velocities are mean velocities, so they are lower than the peak velocity you get by pulse Doppler. Uh, the same concerns that we brought up about the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion apply to the tricuspid S prime velocity. The lower limits of normal is about 9.5 centimeters per second. If you want to round it, say 10 centimeters per second. Less than that is reduced. Okay, so we talked about velocities uh, measurement at the level of the tricuspid annulus. Of course, you can measure velocity at the mid-ventricle and at the apical ventricle. The challenges are alignments. And also, because the amount of displacement decreases, these velocities become less. And there has been nothing in terms of published data that shows you have anything more beyond or that is incremental or more accurate than just relying on the velocity at the level of the tricuspid annulus. So these are not measured. Unlike velocities, strain and strain rate uh, are not, uh, are more reliable signals of segmental performance. They have their limitations and we will touch about them shortly. Um, and you can measure strain on a segmental basis, provided you see the segment well, as well as a group of segments together, be it the three segments in that lateral wall or along the septum. The accuracy of RV strain measurements uh, have been verified against uh, by sonomicrometry. And you see here excellent correlations between echo-derived RV strain and sonomicrometry strain but a lot depends again on the quality of the data and the images that you start with. If you have images with a lot of reverberations, with artifacts, you do not really see the RV free wall. You can do whatever you want, but the strain measurement will not be an accurate measurement. So always start with the quality of the image that you have before saying, I will do my measurements. Um, the strain, as mentioned, can be obtained in the RV free wall as well as in the septal segments. The one that has gained more interest and that is recommended is the RV free wall. The reason that is a, a better reflection of RV function is because the septal strain is also that septum is shared by the LV. RV free wall strain is higher than the strain that includes all six segments. The lower limits of normal is 20, but is dependent on the system that you use uh, to do the measurement. RV free wall strain has been shown to provide incremental prognostic information in patients with heart failure reduced EF, in patients with pulmonary hypertension non-cardiac etiologies, in patients going for a left ventricular assist device and identifying those who end up with RV problems after the device implantation. Let's talk quickly about 3D RV volumes. The ultrasound systems that are now available can do 3D RV volumes. Again, you need to start with the image quality, the absence of artifacts, and we get RV focused views. This is a very important view, as well as trying to trace the endocardium from the short axis views, from the four chamber view and the coronal view. And then you put it together. And so you can see here in that representation that we're able to see the RV inflow, the interventricular septum region, and then the RV outflow tract. And if you have that, then you can look at the changes from end diastole to end systole, and you have a EF and a stroke volume from the 3D RV.
uh, it has been shown uh, from normal database, these are single center studies, not multi center studies, that there are changes in RVEF with age and with sex. So women tend to have a higher ejection fraction than men. And in terms of age, you see a decline in ventricular volumes and an increase in EF with age. In general, about five milliliters decrease per decade for end diastolic volume and three ml per decade for end systolic volume with an about 1% increase in EF per decade. The, upper, the lower limits of normal is 45%, so you want to see an EF above that. There have been validation studies with uh, RV volumes by 3D and EF against CMR. Better correlations for EF than volume, still under estimation. Uh, but acceptable accuracy in terms of EF, if, again, depending on the image quality that you have. Let's talk about RA. So the LA, we rely when we image it in two planes, the apical 4 and the apical 2. For the right atrium, we only have that apical 4 chamber view. And that's the view that we rely on. From the 2015 guidelines, it turns out that the upper limits of normal are different for men compared to women. And this is after taking into account the body size. So the upper limits for the LARA uh, maximum volume index at end systole for men is 39 ml per meter squared. For women, it is 33 ml per meter squared. Let us now talk about uh, pulmonary hypertension, and in there we will talk some about RV diastolic function. So the definition of pulmonary hypertension is based on mean PA pressure, not based on PA systolic pressure which is what we usually try to aim for. There was a time when it was defined as 25 millimeters mercury, now more than 20 millimeters mercury is pulmonary hypertension. Then we have the group of pulmonary hypertension of a cardiac etiology, WHO group two, versus the other groups. The other groups, if we want to sort of take a closer look to differentiate them from the cardiac group, they need an increase in mean PA pressure, but the wedge pressure and better than the wedge pressure LV EDP should be at most 15 millimeters mercury. And then pulmonary vascular resistance is increased, more than three wood units. The normal is less than 1.5. The challenge for us, which of these data can we provide by echocardiography? Um, so we can estimate PA systolic, we can estimate PA diastolic, we can estimate the mean, because we are able to see the left side if there is a left, if there is a reason on the left ventricle, be it depressed EF, heart failure preserved EF, mitral valve disease, we will be able to see that, and of course congenital cases. And then if we see a normal size LV, normal function LV, then we are looking really at non-cardiac reasons. The response to pulmonary hypertension is, uh, from the perspective of the heart, is dealt with by the RV function and RA volume. So if I'm looking at a patient, say, with group 1 pulmonary hypertension, one should aim to not only say these are the pressures, but also say include, which is part of the routine report, this is the RV size, the RV function, and the RA volume. <coughs> How do we get PA systolic pressure? So we need the tricuspid regurg. We acquire it by continuous wave Doppler. We have to get it from multiple windows. We talked about a lot about these windows. Then we need an estimation for the right atrial pressure. And here we have to go to the subcoastal views to look at the inferior vena cava diameter and how it changes with spontaneous respiration and sniffing and sample hepatic veins flow. Sometimes you have an incomplete jet and here you can use the agitated saline or blood saline or ultrasound enhancing agents to get a complete envelope. If a case is referred to the lab with the concern of pulmonary hypertension, we have to go and administer either saline or if we are using ultrasound enhancing agents for endocardial border visualization of the LV, we have to go back and see whether we get a complete TR jet or not. 
the good news is in patients with pulmonary hypertension, you can get a complete envelope in more than 90% of the cases. And then we have to put things together with the 2D findings. And what I mean by that is there are 2D findings that I'll touch on shortly that tell us that RV systolic pressure is increased. And so if we have a TR jet that we think the peak velocity is 2.5 meters per second, something mm -hmm. is wrong. Either my 2D assessment is wrong or that peak TR velocity is not the true peak velocity. So be careful in reporting normal pressures when you see findings pointing to pulmonary hypertension. A very incomplete jet, some people will go here and say this is what we think the peak is, obviously not satisfactory at all. That's an extreme example that I picked. This is a signal uh, where we can see the peak velocity hovering about 3.5, which is a 49 millimeters mercury. And so if we do the modified Bernoulli equation and we add uh, to that 4V squared RAP, we can get an estimate easily of PA systolic pressure. Uh, this is not the only way to estimate PA systolic pressure. If you have attended or you will be attending congenital sessions, patients with VSD, patients with PDA, if we know the blood pressure and we know the peak velocity across the VSD or across the PDA, we can do the modified Bernoulli equation to get directly to the RV systolic pressure. And if there is no pulmonic stenosis, then that would be the PA systolic pressure. Now let us talk about PA diastolic. So here we rely on the pulmonary regurg signal by continuous wave Doppler. We get that from the parasternal short axis view at the level of the base of the RV. We need the subcoastal view still to estimate the RAP. Again, if you use saline or if you use ultrasound enhancing agents, remember that these will enhance the pulmonary regurg signal and this is a very useful signal. High feasibility, not as high as tricuspid regurg, but more than 70% of patients with pulmonary hypertension, you can estimate a PA diastolic. The velocity that we are interested in is the end diastolic velocity that you see by that arrow. So the way we go about it is we again do the modified Bernoulli equation, and so 16, because the end diastolic is about two, is equal to the difference between PA diastolic and RAP. So the only thing left uh, once I have the end diastolic velocity is the addition of RAP. This could be easy, sometimes it is not that easy, but I want to bring up the point that the contribution of RAP to the final number you get for PA diastolic pressure is more than the contribution of the RAP to the PA systolic pressure. And this can lead to major problems. For example, if you estimate, if somebody has an end diastolic velocity of say one, we will say this is four, and then we need to add the RAP. If I estimate the RAP of 10 versus 15 or 20, this could be the difference between an elevated PA diastolic or borderline uh, PA diastolic pressure elevation. So now we talked about PA systolic, PA diastolic, let's talk about mean PA pressure. You remember that pulmonary hypertension is defined by the mean pressure. It is not defined by the PA systolic pressure. One quick way to do it is if I have both TR and PR jets, then to get to the mean is PA diastolic plus one third pulse pressure. The same approach you do say for the uh, sys mean systemic pressure. Another approach is to look at the pulmonary regurg velocity and here the interest is in the peak velocity, not the end diastolic velocity, and then you add the RAP. Sometimes you do not need to in the sense that if you add it, it doesn't change the conclusion. I'll show you a nice example for that. So, so far we relied on TR jet and on PR jet. A third approach is to rely on the actual flow through the RV outflow tract and measure the acceleration time. This is the time between the QRS and the peak velocity that you get in the RV outflow tract. The shorter the acceleration time, the higher the pulmonary artery pressure. In general, in patients with significant pulmonary hypertension, this acceleration time is at most 100 milliseconds. This is not the only regression equation. There have been other regression equations revolving on the same concept. 
and some are used in patients with different heart rates and also depending on the duration of the acceleration time, whether longer or shorter than 120 milliseconds. Uh, another method to estimate mean PA pressure is to look at the systolic gradient between the RV and the RA from the tricuspid regurgitation jet and the idea is uh, the higher the mean gradient that we get from the planimetry of that signal then the higher the mean PA pressure. It needs a special approach, if you would, and that has fallen out of favor, though its validation was convincing when it was published. Uh, another approach is to simply say if someone has a high PA systolic pressure, then they are likely to have a high mean PA pressure, and so let us use this regression equation. In general, we rely more on items one and two, and sometimes three and less on the last two bullets you see on the slide. I included them for the sake of being complete. So the peak velocity of the PR jet is what you use for the estimation of mean PA pressure, and in this case it's 3.4, so without even adding any RAP, we know this patient has a very high uh, mean pulmonary artery and a significant degree of pulmonary hypertension. So. We expressed interest when we started. We said if we want to look at patients with pulmonary hypertension, we want to report PA pressures and we want to have some feel for the pulmonary vascular resistance. And if you sort of step back for a moment, the pressure is a reflection of the flow and the resistance, the product of both. So someone can have a high PA systolic pressure, if there is a large amount of flow, someone else may have an equally elevated PA systolic pressure, but because the pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. So we need to see if there is an approach that gives us a feel for what that pulmonary vascular resistance is. And here we look at that ratio. It was introduced uh, by Dr. Lester and Schiller many years ago. And they are using a surrogate for the pressure as the TR peak velocity and a surrogate of flow as the RV outflow track time velocity integral. The higher the ratio, the higher the pressure. Uh, before we delve into the data validation, just conceptually, as you know, this is not the true pressure. Even if we submit that TR will be perfect and accurate and you will get PA systolic, it is not the PA systolic that is in the numerator of the pulmonary vascular resistance. It's the difference between the mean PA pressure and the wedge pressure or LAP. And so that LAP is ignored altogether and we do not really get the mean from the peak. The second one, the time velocity integral is not equal to the flow, you need the cross-sectional area. Despite these conceptual limitations, if you look at its performance, if you have a pretty high ratio, 0.38, then has great specificity, but for what? For a pulmonary vascular resistance way up, more than eight wood units. And if it is less than 0.12 to 0.15, then pulmonary vascular resistance is normal. Most of the time you see values in between and that becomes a challenge. Nevertheless, thinking about pulmonary vascular resistance when you are evaluating these patients is a step in the right direction. If you look at associations between this ratio and outcome events uh, in the heart and soul study, uh, which took individuals with coronary artery disease and related their subsequent hospitalizations due to heart failure, a ratio more than 0.15 was associated with all-cause mortality and independently associated with that mortality and hospitalizations. So enough of the PA pressures, let's talk about the RAP. And as you know, right atrial pressure is also associated with outcome in different disease states. So how do we go about estimating RAP? The first approach is to look at the inferior vena cava and how its diameter changes from expiration to inspiration. With inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure drops, the venous <coughs> return increases, and then that IVC collapses. So in a normal right atrial pressure, that's the response that you see. On the other hand, in a patient who has an increased RAP, 
the IBC diameter gets larger and not much of a change happens with spontaneous respiration or when you ask the patient to sniff. So the first thing we do when we scan is we look at whether there is spontaneous change or not. There is not collapse and we ask the patient to sniff. The example I show here is an extreme example. Another thing that you can appreciate in that image is the hepatic vein is dilated. There are small studies that show also that the size of the hepatic veins being reflective of RAP. The challenge for relying on IVC diameter and its change with respiration is seen in patients on mechanical ventilation. And when you look at that scatter plot, patients who were on a ventilator shown in these open circles, those not in a ventilator in the closed circles, there is a significant association, albeit standard error of estimate of 4.1, between the IBC collapse index and mean RAP for patients not on a ventilator. But when someone is on a ventilator, it's a scatter plot and there is no significant correlation whatsoever. So we do not rely on IBC collapse or size in patients on mechanical ventilation unless the finding is showing an IBC diameter that is less or at most 12 millimeters. In this case, RAP is usually less than 10 millimeters mercury. So that's the IVC piece. Um, the limitations comes in individuals with respiratory distress who cannot help us in terms of say sniffing. We already talked about the mechanical ventilation point and sometimes in the post-op setting, you don't have subcostal views with a lot of bandages. So now let's shift gears to Doppler. So for Doppler, we record tricuspid and flow level of the annulus and tips. For measurements, we rely on the tips. Similar to the left side, you have peak E, peak A. You look at the E to A ratio. Normal individuals will have a ratio between 0.8 or 2 or 2.1. Less than that, more than that would fall in the abnormal range. We can also measure the D-cell time. In normal individuals, the D-cell time will fall between 120 and 240 or so milliseconds. Less than that, more than that, would fall in the abnormal range. Similar to the left side, this depends on age, this depends on heart rate, and one has to think of these variables. And also very sensitive to respiration. So ideally, you want to record these at end expiration, or if you're going to use them and do some measurements, then you want five consecutive cardiac cycles. We can also record hepatic vein flows and because the transducer is sitting in the subcostal position and the flow is going from these veins to the atrium, so away from the transducer, you will see deflections below the baseline during systole and diastole. In young, healthy individuals, most of the flow is seen in diastole, similar to the pulmonary vein side. Then you can have a small reversal in mid-systole and a reversal at end diastole because of right atrial contraction. This would go up when end diastolic pressure goes up on the right side. Let's look at some examples. That someone with a low E high A, higher ratios, and someone with um, RV dysfunction. You can have restrictive filling and you can have tricuspid E velocity elevated because of TR. That's another reason you want to record the tricuspid E. That's a correlation uh, obtained in 35 cases, some normal, some were not normal hearts between the E to A ratio and the mean right atrial pressure. Similar to the left side, the higher the ratio in diseased hearts, the higher the RAP, but you can appreciate a good degree of scatter, so by itself not particularly helpful. Hepatic venous flow in the presence of a normal right atrial pressure in older individuals, you will see predominant flow in systole and then diastole. So the range here is usually zero to five. When they become equal, it's somewhere between five and 10. If it is diastolic more than systolic, then it's elevated. And you can look at the fraction of forward flow during systole compared to the total flow during systole and diastole. The more the flow, the proportion of flow that occurs during systole, the lower the mean right atrial pressure. The magic cutoff is about 55%. Again, we are taking into account here end expiration or average of consecutive cycles. That's an example of a very large A reversal taken from a patient with a markedly increased RV and diastolic pressure. 
similar to the right to the left side pulmonary vein systolic reversal we had systolic reversal for TR uh, and that's an important variable to uh, pay attention to for the assessment of TR but some patients can have severe TR with a normal RAP or borderline elevated the limitations for relying on hepatic veins in, are seen in these situations, tricuspid valve disease, pericardial compression syndromes, tachycardia, heart blocks, heart transplant recipients, and again, absence of costal windows. Tissue Doppler can be looked at. You can measure the tricuspid E prime velocity, and you can measure the time interval between the end of that systolic ejection velocity and the beginning of E prime, that IVRT. When RAP goes up, that time interval becomes shorter. Some have advocated looking at the ratio of E prime to A prime, where a ratio less than 0.52 signifies diastolic dysfunction. That's the E to E prime uh, ratio. This is from our group showing significant association with RAP. This is from a group from Japan taking patients with pulmonary hypertension, again with significant correlation and showing here that a ratio that is more than 6.8 is associated with worse survival. The limitations are again seen in pericardial compression syndromes, tricuspid valve diseases, because these affect the tricuspid E velocity, and to the extent that there is pericardial velocity, pericardial disease, the tricuspid E prime velocity could be affected. And if you do not have epical windows or there are arrhythmias. <coughs> it's a rough guide. If you have an IVC that collapses with at least 50%, then the mean RAP is 0 to 5, and usually we'll see systolic more than diastolic. If the collapse is more than 50% and the IVC itself is on the dilated side, then it's 5 to 10, usually systolic equal to diastolic. And then if the diastolic more than systolic with less than 50% collapse is 10 to 15, dilated IVC with less than 50% collapse is 20 millimeters mercury or above. The guidelines sort of lumped it into two groups, less than 10 and more than 10. And basically, if you see concordance between the size, the upper limits of normal of the IBC being 2.1 and the collapse, so it's not dilated and it's collapsing, then it's 0 to 5. And if it is not dilated, if it is dilated and non-collapsing, then it's more than 10 and in between, then give an estimate of 8, sort of the middle ground. We talked about 2D findings that you will see with pulmonary hypertension. One of these is the RARB enlargement. And that's an example taken from a patient with a significant degree of pulmonary hypertension. You see a TR here, almost 4.6 or so, very high PA diastolic, high RAP with a small S compared to D. Um, many times it is difficult to get to the true epical position and you end up with views like these. These would not be views that you would rely on to do anything as far as LV volumes. They are off axis. Then look at the interventricular septum. In the presence of pulmonary hypertension, you will see a flat septum systole and diastole. And if you see that mean PA pressure is elevated, usually in excess of 40. So that's a very useful finding. Again, of taking care that these are not oblique of access views. The last point I will touch on is can I tell if from the presence from the echocardiogram, whether this is cardiac or non-cardiac. We said some things will speak for themselves, like mitral valve disease, like a depressed ejection fraction, like congenital heart disease. But the more challenging group are patients with heart failure preserved EF. So this is an example from a patient with pulmonary hypertension, not due to cardiac disease, primary pulmonary hypertension. The, typically, the E to A ratio is less than one with reduced E velocity. Why? Because there is reduced flow because of the RV dysfunction and the pulmonary hypertension into the left atrium. Septal annular velocities are often reduced because some of the contribution to that velocity is from the RV with depressed function, but the lateral velocity is preserved. If you see that combination, this is non-cardiac pulmonary hypertension. In comparison, if you see both velocities reduced, a ratio E more than A with decent velocities, here we're looking at 120, then this is a cardiac reason. We, our group looked at that several years ago, showing you the group with uh, cardiac here in the interrupted line open circles against the lateral E to A ratio. So the ratio you rely on in terms of E to E prime ratio is the lateral side, not the septal side. 
you see all the groups with non-cardiac pulmonary hypertension had a ratio that did not reach the seven value. Uh, that's my last summary slide. Uh, these are the numbers if you're working RV that you need to memorize. The minimum measurement we want to do is the basal diameter from the RV focused view. Upper limits normal 4.1. Subcoastal view for wall thickness as we talks, talked. Upper limits 5 millimeter. The parasternal short axis distal diameter for the RV outlaw tract upper limits 2.7. Again, in that same view, RV basal view, parasternal short axis, you can get the proximal RVOT. And here the upper limits is 3.5. Not much in favor of RA dimensions. Volumes are now replacing these dimensions. But if you want to do the major dimension, this is measured from the roof of the RA to the tricuspid annulus, and it's more than 5.3, that's abnormal. The minor dimension goes from the mid of the lateral wall to the mid of the septum perpendicular to that long uh, axis and the upper limits is 4.4. For area, it is 18 centimeters squared. Of these, the one that I would say you must remember is that 4.1 and that five millimeters thickness. Um, for TAPSI, the lower limits of normal is 17 millimeters for the tricuspid S prime velocity or A for annular here. The lower limits of normal is 9.5 if you want to sort of memorize it and do one thing, say 10. Not really need to worry about the myocardial performance index, but the fractional area change you need to know it should be more than 35 percent the tricuspid e to a ratio less than 0.8 more than two a tricuspid e to e prime more than six we seldom measure d cell time so thank you